my talk is on valuation and distance analysis in the post COVID-19 era. Uh, I'll be looking at some technical issues and also some case studies to show you what companies could do in terms of when they come out of the post COVID, hopefully, hopefully when the vaccines are all available and we can fly again, uh, things may come to some normal, but maybe not the normal that we were used to before. Okay, so essentially COVID-19, the crisis has, is driving fundamental changes in consumer values, supply chains, routes to market and knocking companies off balance. We all know this. I've given many talks on this area as well. Immediate action, of course, is to address short-term liquidity challenges, and that is cash. Now, of course, in many Western countries, uh, Australia, USA, they have done what is called quantitative easing and pumped a lot of money into their economy, okay, by what was called money printing. So they've increased the supply of money and many of those has gone to individuals and companies to keep them afloat. So Australia has a job seeker program, sorry, a job keeper program that money is paid to companies uh, to keep the staff on uh, without having to fire the staff. But in the longer term, the challenge is, of course, to get new opportunities, okay, to solve our cost profitability issues, but also seek the funding for new opportunities. While some shifts have been temporary, others will never be the same, okay? So the new normal will be never the old normal, okay? It's going to be something different. In such change circumstances, management accountants and business analysts need to consider how this new normal has affected the value of their companies and how such value should be stress tested. Now, of course, we know that many of the companies in Sri Lanka are not listed public companies. So what I'm going to cover is both listed and also non-listed companies. Okay, now in terms of value investment, if you go back in history, what we mean by value investors is that they look, they hunt for value. Now this value may be something in terms of the assets, but it also may be in terms of profits and cash flow generation. So the focus is on price in relation to businesses value. Now we call, there are other people called momentum investors. Uh, these are all often called day traders. Okay, they only care about the price, 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 price. Okay, and this is also known as the greater fool approach because you buy when the market is going up, hoping that there'll be someone else, a greater fool than you to buy it when the market is higher. Of course, if the market goes the other way, you lose all the money. These are called momentum investors. Now, I won't be looking at that. I'll be looking mainly at value investing. Now, there's also part of value investing called growth investors they focus on the prospects of rapid expansion. So price, current price takes a distant second to what it could be with growth. So because weighing price versus value, and these are two different things, huh? what we call price after market price could be actually quite different from the value someone places on it. And the value could be a whole host of other reasons, merely not the price, okay? So when price versus value is paramount in value investing, those in this school have a reputation of being long-term oriented and not making short-term profits. Now the, the, the key, the, the king of this area of value investing, the one who wrote the book is Warren Buffett. I think all of you have heard of Warren Buffett. He began his career nearly 70 years ago by investing in drab beaten up companies trading for less than the liquidation value of the assets. So the actual physical assets, okay, uh, were, were more than the liquidation, sorry, the liquidation value of those assets was more than the, what they were asking for those assets. So it was a good buy, okay, to buy these and often break it up and sell it at a higher price. Now Buffett later focused his company when he became big he focuses company on branded companies, okay? He wanted a lot of money to generate cash for him to buy other companies. And he focused on companies like Coca-Cola and AIG 
AIG is a big insurance company. He focused on this because these are companies that give you a regular cash flow for him to reinvest. So a lot of his followers of Buffett have been also doing the same thing. Known companies, we know what their business is. Cash flow is sort of very much accepted and it's, it's, it's known, okay? These are the companies that these followers went. But Buffett recently said he has made a mistake. He said he should have bought into tech companies. Earlier he didn't buy it because he didn't understand those businesses. Okay, he admitted that he made a mistake by not buying Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google. And in fact, he went into the tech field hugely and bought into Apple. And in early 2016, he had about 50 billion, okay, which was Buffett's largest single holding at 50 billion in Apple. But what has he done after COVID-19? He has actually got out of Apple, not fully, some of Apple and is invested in pharmaceutical companies. You can see the obvious re reason why he's going to the pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, Moderna, and so on are now becoming household names. Okay. So Warren, Warren Buffett is now suggesting that the value that investors is to look forward. What can these pharmaceutical companies give us? What can these tech companies give us? These are called forward valuations. So he's not looking backwards at what is the asset value of the company and how we can sell it or what is the cash flow that it has generated in the past and that will continue instead of looking at growth prospects. Okay, so all, in, all value investors continue to agree that price is an important component of value. That is why we call it value investing. The debate is how is now about what drives value, what are the drivers of value? And I'll be coming to this a little later what will drive both the economy and the market forward over the next generation. It appears that traditional value players are receding in market capitalization. So earlier, they went into the ones that had regular cash flow that mentioned Coca-Cola and um, AIG, the insurance company. But now these traditional players are receding in the values. In fact, in the top 10 companies by market valuation in 2019, there was no oil and gas. Uh, Exxon Mobil was number 12, okay? So you can see they are all dominated by Amazon, Facebook, uh, Alphabet, Microsoft, and so on. Of course, others say that there's a short-term bubble basket that includes Tesla, Netflix, and Amazon that these companies have still to make profit. Amazon is finally making a profit, okay? It took them 12 years to make a profit, okay? Tesla not yet, okay? So these are, they call bubble baskets that will soon crash. But the fact is that these bubble baskets have lasted over 10 years. These bubbles have lasted over 10 years, okay? So it's no longer just a short term price going up and price going down. Now, talking about valuation, there are actually two valuation approaches. It's very important for us to understand this. Okay, numbers versus narratives. Narratives means storytelling, okay? So people who are going to the numbers, and we've done a lot of numbers in the CMA program, they believe that valuation should be about financial modeling variables and constants. That is, that numbers and numbers will tell the story. No use of any other story. And that these other things that you hear people talking about, oh, these are good stock and that's, that's going up and so on, are distractions. They bring irrationality into investing. That is what the numbers people behave. While the narratives people, the storytellers say, no, 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 that's not right. Okay, valuation is about great stories. What can the company do? Who are its um, uh, managers? Who are its... Um, its chairman, what's his, what are the shareholders like? Great stories. What are their, what's their business model? And they say that any financial modeling is, gives only misplaced confidence, okay? Especially when there's a lot of uncertainty about future values, uncertainty about infl inflation, uncertainty about growth, lots, lots of uncertainty. It gives a misplaced value. We come with a number and we think, ah, that's the number. They say that's a, uh, misplaced confidence. 
Now, the thing is that we need both. So going back here, the numbers people, they are Excel Ninja. A lot of us of these Excel Ninjas are listed to this program. Masters are modeling, accounting, task masters. The stories people, spinners are wonderful tales and creative geniuses. So what we need is actually an intermediary that can talk both languages, both the numbers and the storytelling and connects the narratives to the numbers. Okay, let's see if what they're telling in the stories match somewhat in the numbers. So they bring discipline to both sides. Okay, so good valuation requires both. The numbers people, their favorite tools are accounting statements, Excel spreadsheets, statistical measures, pricing data, okay? And the, the narratives people have favored tools of anecdotes, experiences, person observed, behavioral evidence. So they are all more stories. But the problem is that the numbers people are having illusions and delusions about what they're doing. They are confusing precision with accuracy. They have it's the 10th decimal place, but the first number is wrong. Okay. So they basically think that the data can control reality, but actually it can't. Well, the narratives people, okay, they think that creativity cannot be quantified. Actually, we can quantify creativity. Okay, and I'll show you some examples, okay? So if the story is good, they think the investment will be as, as good and they think experience is the best teacher. Let's forget about the numbers. Okay, so we need someone to bridge this gap, okay? And actually the modeling people, okay, remember that modeling is not a valuation. Essentially, we ask what is value added by growth assets? What is the value added by existing assets? So we have assets that are existing in the company. What value is added by those assets? What are the new assets? What are the growth assets? Okay. What are the risks involved for both equity and firm value? And especially a very important thing is the mature firm because the mature firm probably has fulfilled its growth potential. And unless it looks for new potentials, okay, it's just going to be based on old business models. Okay, we saw what happened to great companies like Nokia, okay? The business model changed, okay? So we have to say, what can we do about these mature companies and what are the potential roadblocks that they will face in trying to in the value. So this is very important post COVID-19. So let's look at the different valuation approaches. The first one is replacement costs. Okay, it's possible with discrete items of property, plant and equipment, that is the replacement of something, but more difficult with the intangible assets such as a skilled workforce or brand value. Okay, so company like Google, their value is a, is an algorithm, a search algorithm, you can't use replacement cost on that. What is of course the favorite of the storytellers is a rule of thumb valuations. Okay, example, 10 times EBITDA. How many times have I heard top accounting firms go down to just ah, 10 times EBITDA, 10 times revenue, okay? They do no calculations and they look at the story and come up with these valuations, okay? These are rule of thumb valuations, okay? And they charge you a lot of money for these. There are, of course, a little bit better income projection, but now we are getting closer to the numbers, okay? Where we get a present value of expected future cash flows. We get a net present value, which means, of course, that you need to calculate a weighted average cost of capital to discount the cash flows, okay? Cost of equity and cost of debt. And of course, the, the ideal valuation is if you are, a, listed company is a market valuation, okay? The market is telling us what the company is worth. But the problem is a lot of companies in Sri Lanka, especially, okay, is not listed. So we need what we call proxy valuations. Okay, so let's look at the numbers valuation approaches, okay? Public companies, as I already told you, have a built-in valuation in the stock market. The private companies, there are many, many uh, models that have been developed. 
that are those that, that are based on accounting and market-based measures, such as the price earnings ratio, and I'll introduce that very quickly later, and the market to book ratio. Okay. Then there are discounted cash flow measures. Again, I'll introduce it to you. You all have already done this in the CMA program. Uh, shareholder value added, which is a discounted cash flow measure. The above valuation approaches can also obviously be used in public companies to see if there are arbitrage opportunities. Then, of course, we have to think about risk assessments. There's continuing value. I'll be talking about what that means. That is the value of the company after the, a certain planning period. A firm has a going concern. And we are going to also look very quickly at distress analysis. So there's a fair amount of area to cover. Now, initially, let's look at the ratios. These are the DuPont ratios. And we're going to use these ratios, essentially past information to try to project the value of a company. And you can see that what we do is we use a price earnings ratio. The share price, price earnings ratio is your share price divided by the earnings per share. That's your price earnings ratio. So if you can get a representative price earnings ratio for your industry, if you get a value for this for the industry and you multiply it by your own, own earnings per share, that should give you your estimated share price, okay? So that's one method of doing it by using this ratio, okay? To multiply your industry ratio with your earnings per share. So here is an example of that. Here are the DuPont ratios, okay? That come about, many of you know these ratios. But once it comes to this area here, we have the earnings per share, which is the net profit after tax divided by the number of shares, you multiply that by a representative price earnings ratio. What is represented for your industry? You can get this from any, any industry source and that will give you your share price. So that is using the DuPont ratios, extending it to the share price. There's also something called the market to book ratio, very popular amongst valuers, but I don't know why, because it's not a very, good method, it's, it has a lot of flaws in it. Essentially what you do is you take the market capitalization divided by the book value, that is your own balance sheet equity value, and that gives you your market to book valuation. Okay, so you can see here that if you take a representative market to book value and multiply by your own financial accounting equity value, you should get an estimation of market capitalization. Okay, so that is essentially what we are saying. Okay, you can obtain the market to book ratio from some sort of commercial source and multiply this by your own book value, your own equity value. Okay, and that gives you your market value. So, two methods price earnings ratio method and market to book ratio method. Okay, so here's just a cartoon to break it up. Hey, Dilbert, what are you doing for the EBITDA today? So Dilbert asks what? And his boss says uh, EBITDA uh, means earnings before interest, uh, taxes, uh, depreciation, and he doesn't know what the A is. And he says ammonia, okay? These people put these terms out. They don't know, know even what it means. Okay, so what are the steps in a good valuation? That's very, very important. First of all, get the narrative, get the story. Develop a narrative of the business that you are valuing. In the narrative, you tell your story about how you see the business evolving over time. Then test if the narrative is possible, plausible, and probable. I'm going to explain this in a little bit more. Is it possible? Okay, if it's possible, is it plausible? If it's plausible, is it probable? Three different things, okay? There are lots of possible narratives. Only some of them are plausible and only a few of them are probable. Now we come to the numbers. Step number three, you can see, you look at the sales growth potential. What are the growth assets in terms of fixed assets and working capital? What's the profit margin, tax implications? All of these are the number crunching, okay? Many of you have done this in the SVA calculations in the CMA program. But don't stop there, okay? Convert the drivers of these value, these value drivers into final valuation using discounted cash flow methods to come up with the present value. Again, don't stop there. 
do the feedback loop. In other words, go back and check with your stories. You might find that someone else knows more about your industry or the industry that you're valuing than you do. So go back and ask the experts, ask them, is this numbers correct? And so on. Okay, so these are the steps in a good valuation. So let's look at this thing about the, probab the possible, plausible and probable. The impossible stories are that you are expecting the company to be bigger than the economy, bigger than the total market for that company, that the profit margins are greater than 100% and that there is depreciation without any capital expenditure. So these are impossible stories. There are a few people who are peddling these stories and I'll tell you a few in a little while. Implausible is that you can have growth without reinvestment, that you can continue to grow without reinvestment in your fixed and working capital, that you can continue to generate profits without competition stepping in, and that there are all returns without risks. We know that that's not plausible. And then you go to the improbable, okay? You can see that it's based on growth, risk, and reinvestment. High growth and low reinvestment, not probable. Maybe someone can do it, but most likely not probable. High growth and low risk, again, not probable. That you can have high growth without any risk. And low risk and high reinvestment, again, not probable. Okay, so these are where you now come and look at the numbers and say, is it probable or not? So let's look at Uber. I think all of you know, uh, I think in Sri Lanka, it's uh, pick me and so on. But let's look at Uber, you will know about it. So the possibility was that Uber could dominate the car ownership market. In other words, every single person who wants a car will instead choose Uber. That's possible, most likely impo impossible, but it's a possibility. But now you go to the plausible, that they will dominate the suburban and car service and rental market, not only in the cities, but also in the outside the cities. But from there, you get the most probable that they will dominate the city taxi market, which they did. But what was not in this story was what they did next, especially with the COVID-19, okay, that they connected up the drivers, riders, and also we had Uber Eats and so on. So sometimes these stories change as we learn more and more about what the company is doing. Now let's look at a very interesting company called Theranos, a USA company. The story was this, they claimed that they had been able to do blood tests even in shopping malls. Okay, you go to a shopping mall, you give a microscopic amount of blood and instantly they will give you a blood test. Of course, we have had a similar thing now with COVID-19, but here they said you can do blood tests instantly and get the full report. Okay, the founder was Elizabeth Homer, Stanford University dropout, quite a beautiful woman. Okay, quite an energetic, beautiful woman. And you can see the problem with all men, her board members, okay, she was 31. Uh, her ex-boyfriend was the president, but all the other board members were in their 90s, okay. Henry Kissinger, okay, Joel Suits, Secretary of State, Bill Frost, Sam Dunn, former senator, 77, okay, and so on. So you can see old men like myself, you know, might get interested in this young girl. They all join the board. So very good board. Huh? Look at that board. Then look at the validation. Safe invested. That's a big uh, so shopping, um, uh, what is this? Um, de department, sorry, a supermarket store. Um, sorry, it's a department store. It's 350 million. Okay, they got insurers to provide um, uh, lab work for them. The FDA of America, the Food and Drug Administration approved it, or so we thought. And it was named the Bioscience Company of the Year. The investors, major investors, Walton Family, Rupert Murdoch of Australia, Betsy DeVos, Cox Media, huge investors, look at that. Look at those validations, 150 million and so on. Then the problem started. They found that it was all a con, okay? That the blood testing was actually 
done in traditional machine. They were, they were not being able to do it. And the US Exchange Commission, okay, said that there was a complete fraud and they were indicted on multiple counts of wire fraud. Now the case would have been heard if not for COVID-19, so it's been postponed, but we know what's going to happen, okay? The result anyway, when this case was brought about was that Theranos announced that the email to investors that would seize operations, release its assets and remaining cash to creditors after all efforts to find a buyer came to nothing. In fact, they all lost their money. So that is an impossible story. Let's look at a plausible story. Tesla, this is a story that we can see unfolding today. Okay. The narrative is that the market value of Tesla in January 2020, pre-COVID was 80 billion. In just the space of 11 months, it went to 554 billion. Six fold surge, okay. Tesla is now worth more than the combined value of Volkswagen, Hyundai, General Motors, and Ford combined. The PE ratio, okay, 12 months trailing was 926 and 12 months forward 158. These are massive numbers. So how do you explain this great surge in the Tesla share price? Lots of speculation. Lots of retail investors with this quantitative easing had money to burn. Okay, after the government released the information, the, the money under quantitative easing. They also said that Tesla is going to be added to the S&P index of leading US shares. And that meant that they would be able to capture money from big uh, funds like Vanguard and Fidelity Tracking. If you're in that SP index, you get automatically these big um, funds can invest in you. So that was the reason they said, okay, that's a story explaining the massive rise of Tesla. Tesla. But what are the numbers? The current production is 500,000 cars, just 1% of the global market. It is 1 20th of the production of VW in 2019. They would need to produce 10 million cars to catch up with Volkswagen. At the moment, remember 500,000, okay? They are building three massive, what they call gigafactories in Berlin, Shanghai, and Austin. But these could only potentially get 2.1 million cars by 2025. They need to come up to 10 million just to catch up with VW. Okay. Although this is a growth rate of 35% per year, it's not enough to catch up with VW. Now, the only way that Tesla could have this sort of valuation is if their profit margin is 20 times higher than VW. In other words, to make and sell a Tesla, you can get a profit 20 times higher. It could be higher, but not 20 times higher. Okay. The price cost ratios compared between Tesla and VW do not indicate that this is possible. Unless, of course, the gigafactories are all manned by Santa's little helpers. Okay. I'm just being funny here, but you know, everyone, the Santa's helpers, in one day, they make enough toys for the whole world. And then also get it delivered by UPS, um, TNT, uh, DHL, and so on around the world, and Amazon Prime, okay, all in one day. So if you have workers like this, or robotics like this, then maybe Tesla's valuation is possible. But other than that, it's a valuation that the numbers don't stack up. But people are saying all sorts of things. The Tesla is going to give internet for the whole world by 2021. Then they're going to connect all their batteries in houses to give us electricity grid connecting the whole world and so on. There are lots of stories that are coming out and some of them given by the, the founder and president Elon Musk. Okay, so the probable. Now let's look at step number three. This is where the numbers come in. Start with the growth market. I've talked about this. What's the sales growth potential? What's, what are the assets that we're going to invest in? What's the profit margin, tax implications, free cash flow from operations and so on. These are what we have to do in the number crunching. This is step number three and four, okay? Where we get it all to a present value. Okay, so let's now look at 
an example. These are seven value drivers. Some of you have seen this. I mentioned this before. Sales growth rate, operating profit margin, cash tax rate, fixed capital needs, working capital needs, okay, planning period, and cost of capital. Okay, the first five are required to generate free cash flow, and then you use the other two, the last two, to discount it to a present value. So now I'll give you a case study of Virgin Australia. Okay, this is an airline that got into trouble during the COVID-19. Okay, of course, all airlines got into trouble. So let's look at Virgin and what happened. Now Virgin's uh, 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 accounts, even before COVID-19, take in 2019, okay, June 2019, you can see this is uh, their sales and EBITDA. This is their total assets and their total capital, of course, that balances. Of this uh, total debt of 5077, the market value for some reason, although the balance sheet said this, they also had a note that the market value was 1152. Because I don't know why the accountants didn't put the total debt at market value. Anyway, it was a separate. Now, taking these numbers of sales growth, profit margin, and so on, you will see that also some numbers that are given in the in the balance sheet, the cost of debt and cost of equity, 8% and 12%. And the sales growth, if you look at the numbers, will be about 8% and the profit margin is just 2%. The cash tax rate is, is the Australian rate of 30%. Okay, in, the fixed capital investment was high, but working capital was negative. Okay, and you can't get growth without investing. Okay, the weight average cost of capital, we've just calculated there, okay, based on the, the weights. And that's 8.43 there. And let's look at a two-year planning period. Now, this is what the value of the company is. And without going into too much detail, the operating value was 513 if you have a two-year planning period. The business value was, the continued value, that's the, the value as a, in a steady state was 730, that gives you 1243. Assuming because they haven't reported about any market of securities, they have external debt of 5077, which means that this company, Virgin, was already the walking dead. It was a dead company, it was a zombie company, even before COVID 19. Okay, look at that. Okay, it is a walking dead. Too much of debt. So what happened, and also you can see that the company had 2.3 billion in secured creditors, 3.3 billion in unsecured creditors. And they had 407 all in billions and uh, 9,000, that's actually exactly 9,000 employees. Okay, so if you take out the debt, of course the company have a, has a value of 1243. But how can you take off the debt? Well, what happened was there was a play for the company and Bain Capital made a play for the company, a hedge fund. And there it's essentially, uh, here remember it's 1244 1, 4 divided by 457, which is 0.36 per share. That's the valuation that I did with the simple SVA model. Bain Capital came in and offered almost exactly, well, 2.9, 29 cents, okay? My valuation excluding the debt was 36 cents, right? Now, how can you exclude debt? Simple, they say, we are not gonna pay you. All unsecured debtors were wiped off and the secured debtor said, unless we, we can pay you about six cents in the dollar, that's all we'll pay you, right? And take it or leave it. Otherwise, we are not going to take, the company's a walking dead anyway. And they agreed, okay? So this is what happened, okay? Great Australian company. It was in trouble, taken over by a USA hedge fund with quantitative easy money that was pumped into those companies, give them so much of cash that they could buy these assets. But I can't see how it's going to survive. Frankly, the numbers become in the area of impossible. Okay, now very quickly, how do you value startup companies? 
Okay, we don't have any numbers to play with. We don't know what their past history is. We cannot draw on the company's history. You have no product service. It is difficult to gauge market potential or profitability. The company entire value lies in the future growth, but you have little to base your estimates on. So what can you do? Well, you have to go back into all the growth assets, the existing assets, and so on. Okay, you have to ask, what are the cash flows from existing assets? Okay, are they non-existent or are they negative? Often these cash flows can be negative initially. Okay, what are the, uh, what is the um, value of the equity of the firm? Different claims on cash flows can affect the value of equity at each stage. Claims on the cash flow, okay, from venture capitalists and so on. What about the riskiness? Limited historical data on earnings and no market prices or equity makes difficult to assess risk. Okay. And when will the firm become mature firm? That's very important because what is the growth model? Initially, it gets into the S curve, starts going up, and then what are the potential for roadblocks? So I'm not going to give any answer, but you have to ask these questions. What are the values added by growth assets? What are the existing assets? Okay, what's the value of equity? These are the questions that you need to ask. And these things over here is, a, is things that are potential problems in each of these areas of valuing a startup. Okay, now given the time, I'm gonna move very quickly into distress analysis. It's a, once again, an area that you'll have covered in the CMA program. I'm gonna use what is called Z-score. There are many, many Z-scores, but I'm gonna use the original one by Edward Altman, okay? It has stood the test of time. It was developed in 1960s and it's still giving us good numbers, okay? What did Altman do? Out of a selection of 22 financial ratios, he found that five could be combined to discriminate between bankrupt and non-bankrupt companies. Okay, later in 1993, he created a four variable version that could be used in any company, private and public, Okay, both manufacturing and service. Only thing he can't use is in banking companies. So Altman's Z-score version was these the, the Z-score, okay, using these coefficients, multiply these ratios, and if you get a score of 2.6 or more, you are okay. If you get a score of 1.1 or below, you are bankrupt, and in between 1.1 and 2.6, you are in the gray area. You could fail or you could be okay. Okay, so this is the model and many of you have seen this model. So I put, did this on Virgin Australia with then 2019 accounts. And look what I found. The company was in the gray area. Less than a safe score. Now, <clears throat> Bain Capital obviously would have done these numbers They've decided, okay, we'll take the company over at a very low cost to the shareholders, get it to the debt holders, and we might make it. But I can't see if the airline business doesn't start up in the next six to one year, how they're going to make their money. It looks like the many hedge funds are just investing in a whole lot of areas because they have money to burn. Okay. They don't expect everyone to make a profit. Okay, so now we get to the stress testing. And the stress testing is essentially where we're using this step three to start to vary the numbers to see how much a stress it can take. Okay. So look at Virgin. What I did was I said, okay, because of COVID-19 and the airlines are starting, let's put down the sales growth rate, but by cutting a lot of the staff and a lot of the interest calculations for their debt, let's put up the profit margin, okay? So if sales growth falls to 8% from 8% from to 5%, the profit margin must increase from 2% to 6% to give us Bain's valuation, okay? To give the valuation that Bain has, okay? We need to have this. Now, can, can um, uh, Virgin do it? I doubt it. I doubt it if they can get off operating profit of 6%, and have a sales growth of 5% in this year, in the next two years, okay? So this is the sort of stress testing that you'll do. Change the variables, 
use the goal seek feature of Excel and come up with their stress test. Okay. Okay. Now let's very quickly uh, to finish off, let's look at your company in the post COVID-19 world. The question on every CEO's mind is how long will it last? While possible scenarios range from quick recovery to prolonged chaos, there are five key levers available to outmaneuver uncertainty. You have to manage your liquidity, finance and credit you have to look at, eliminate and reduce costs, act, try to tap into government aid programs and look at your entire portfolio of assets. Okay. So we are things called control drivers, <clears throat> understand the driver that generate cash and liquidity, predict what liquidity will look like based on business decisions. You can use Google analytics, data analytics, etc. Okay. And see that you can control as much as possible, especially the liquidity decision of the company, at least in the short run, the top management should do this. Model to optimize working capital. That's another area where we have to make sure that we are optimizing our management of working capital. Review your capex, and this is, should be at the top management level. Okay. CEOs and CFOs must take control of all decision making before the investment is made. Okay. All the capital allocation decisions, cash flow decisions must be made right at the top. Resets the company's cost baseline. We know this. I mean, already companies are firing staff, but that is not enough in the long run. Many companies resorted to eliminating drastically or, or drastically cutting costs. These immediate measures are not sustainable. You still need your staff and so on. Once the crisis stabilizes, the next priority is to reset the company's cost baseline. In this year's budget, we likely to be redone. You have to redo the budget after COVID-19. New cost, consumer values have surfaced, such as Zoom. New opportunities will present themselves and new ways of working will become ingrained, such as working from home. Now, one of the big things that we are, everyone is talking about is the word variableize. Now, we have done this many times the same program, variable costs. In other words, try to make as much as your fixed costs into variable costs, okay? Your outsource a lot of things that you can do, especially not those that are crucial, but others that can be outsourced. And you can move your software to the cloud, all these things. Now, Amazon has done one better. Every single item of their costs, not every single, but a lot of their costs, they're made into revenue streams. So they wanted to, they needed cloud computing, they started their own Amazon cloud. They needed a supply chain, they started Amazon Prime. So every one of their costs has become a revenue center for Amazon. Brilliant story, okay? Think about that for your own company as well. Okay, so continue focus on cost reduction. We provide the funding to invest in these new opportunities. And then we have growth drivers. As I told you, you can't grow without reinvestment. You need to grow, okay? You have to have discipline around cost management and reinvest in your strategic in, uh, initiatives, okay? And you've got to get the culture going in the organization, ongoing culture and behavioral change, the unique opportunity to drive a broad ownership culture for costs in the organization, to mobilize a broad organization around the ideas of developing smarter ways of working and spending money. To generate additional savings in the future to fuel growth. So get that company culture going. And I repeat this many times, you need to reinvest. Understand the changes in consumer behavior after COVID-19. Okay, what has changed? Okay, and try to take advantage of these opportunities. Reevaluated the competitive landscape. This crisis has the potential to drastically change the competitive landscape in some industries, especially tourism, travel, and so on. Some of the current competitors might not survive, while new ones might emerge in this environment. I know that one Sri Lankan company got affected not with COVID, but with the Easter bombing. They were a tour agency. They were handling people from overseas because there were no more overseas people coming. 
they went and became an interior design company. First, they started with the hotels that they were bringing guests to and said, we'll, we'll do a nicer hotel when they start coming back. But then they moved to actually do condominiums and so on. So they had a second line of business that are not related to tourism, okay, by looking at other opportunities. So think about that for your own companies. Running scenarios to better understand the new company landscape can drive the future growth strategy. Now, there are some winners and losers. I've shown this before, okay? I don't think that this is exactly right. This is not my work, but essentially they think that some losers like the airlines will be there, okay? But don't worry if you are in the loser column. You have to think about what are the opportunities that your business has that can get you into the winner column. For example, if you're a travel agent, you can't be handling people anymore, but of course handling goods has become very important or your packages and so on. So why don't you become a supply chain company? You have the same skill set and so on. Think about other opportunities. Okay, so with that, thank you.